So whether you're new or not, we have been in this series called The Life of Peter, where we've been looking at this guy by the name of Peter for the last eight weeks. We've kind of been following his life. He starts out as this young fisherman, and then he becomes this pastor and preacher and missionary, and now we find him as like this wise guy, right? Like this wise elder. He's had high highs and low lows, and he's gone throughout his life, but he has been transformed from young kid to, to sage, to, to this wise individual. And he gets to write down and share his wisdom with the next generation of Jesus followers, and he writes to us as well. So before we hop in and conclude this series, would you please pray with me? Father God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. We thank you for the weather. We thank you for the beautiful day, God. I just thank you for these people here, your people, God, your church. I just pray that <clears throat> as we look into scripture, Lord, you would just uh, allow it to, to uh, transform us from the inside out as, as you often do, God. You are the, the healer and the transformer of people. And so, God, we just pray that we would walk away better than when we came in. God, I just always ask that you would use me for these next few moments as we look and study your word and your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just to remind you, Peter is writing to fellow believers. He's writing to fellow Christians. In 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he, he addresses to who he's writing to. He says, to God's elect, the exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Asia Minor, that is. And he's writing to them because they need some, some good reminders. They're constantly facing opposition. And so imagine being a Jesus follower 2,000 years ago. That was not the politically correct thing to do. If you followed Jesus 2,000 years ago, it was not normal. You were the weirdo. Most people back then, they worshipped pagans, they, they worshipped false gods or idols or dozens or hundreds of different gods. If you claimed Jesus 2,000 years ago, people looked at you differently. And I think it's kind of the same for us today, is it not? Like if we tell our friends or our coworkers, hey, we follow Jesus, they might give you a little look. They might think, hey, you're the weird one. You're the not normal person. But the reality is there are more Christians on earth today than there ever have been. Now nationally in the United States, some people think we're, we're on a decline with, with professing and confessing Christians. So that, that's a different story for a different day. But right now, we have more Christians on earth today, but yet we still have problems. We have more brothers and sisters in Christ today, yet we still face opposition and rejection. Why? Part of the issue, I believe, is that we have allowed the world the outside ungodly influences to determine how we think, what we think, how we act, and how we live. Some of us, we have allowed our friends to influence us in certain ways. We have allowed TV, social media, the news, CNN, and or Fox to teach us how to live. And if you have a student aged 10 to 25, they are getting their theology from TikTok. And that's a scary place, let me tell you that. We are confused, we are broken, we are easily persuaded and influenced. So what do we do? What am I getting at? Well, I believe very, very strongly that the Bible teaches us how to live. The Bible teaches us what to do. And guess what? It's not easy. None of this is easy. Now, I believe that it is simple, but simple doesn't mean easy. And guess what else? People are going to judge you for following Jesus. People are going to make fun of you for following Jesus. They are going to reject you and they are going to think you're crazy for following a book of rules that is thousands of years old. But what I have learned in the 30 years of my life is that when I trust Jesus and follow his word and obey his word, life doesn't get easier, but it gets better. And so this is what Peter is getting at. He says, hey, I know, I know things are tough. I know there's opposition. In fact, you've been exiled. You've been scattered about. And here's what I want you 
to know because the world says, do this, live this way, whatever it is, do it the way that you want to do it, do it the way that you see fit. But, but Peter is saying, man, Jesus tells us to live a different life. Peter is saying, Jesus tells us to live differently. If you were here last week, this living different it is known as living a life that is holy. Holiness means set apart. It means different. And Scott, Scott made us know that it, it, it doesn't mean perfect, but it means different. And if you were here last week, we read from 1 Peter chapter 2, and Peter was talking to his readers and his audience, and he said, you have to rid yourselves of malice, deceit, uh, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Why? Because that's how the world lives. That's how the world acts. That is what is considered normal by worldly standards, but we are not of this world, and so therefore, we can't look like everyone around us. And last week, Scott taught us that changed people live changed lives. We cannot say, I have a changed new life in Christ if I look like the non-believer. And that's why Peter is writing this letter. He's reminding the people who have been scattered and he's reminding us today. And that's why we can apply what he writes to our life because we are either off base or we need a reminder of what we are called to do. We are called to live radically different lives than the people around us in the world, but not of the world. And so every night I have an opportunity to pray with and for my children. Now I've been explaining over the last couple of services, my kids go through a bedtime routine that you would think they're supermodels. I mean, it is like the most time consuming thing. They get, they get bathed, they get lotioned up, you know, they got the little face rollers and we, we, all these things. I'm like, there's two and a half. What are we doing here? And so we finally get past all that nonsense and we get to the bedtime, right? The actual time where we're in bed and uh, we, we read a bedtime story and it's actually so cute. This is completely off topic. My son, there's a book, it's called Counting Through the Bible. He has it memorized and it is incredible. He goes through the, uh, the, the spiritual armor of God and the fruit of the spirit. He can literally say joy, peace, patience, kindness in his little talk. Anyway, that's, that's besides the point, it's cool. So we read a bedtime book and then we pray. And every night when I pray with and for my children, I say, God, keep my kids happy, keep my kids healthy, and keep my kids holy. Now, happiness, not in a sense of earthly happiness. If I'm going to pray for health and, and holiness, I needed another H, so I said happiness, okay? But I really mean like Christian joy, like Christ-likeness. Like, I, I just pray that my kid would always just radiate Christ from his being, because I don't really know if God actually cares about our happiness or not. I, I don't know about that. What I do know is that he cares if we love him. And he cares if we look more like him. And I feel like when we are more like Christ, that leads to happiness. It can lead to happiness. And then I, I, I pray for happiness, but I really mean joy. And then I pray for health. I say, God, keep my kids healthy. G give them a long life. Give them a full life. Because you know if you're healthy... You know the cliche, you are wealthy. And I know there's a lot of people in this room who are dealing with health issues and problems and cancer and sickness and disease. And we don't want anyone to ever deal with that, especially our children. And so God, I just, I, I pray for health. And then I say, at the end, I say, God, above happiness and health, because we're not always gonna be happy and we're not always gonna be healthy. I say, God, keep my kids holy. I pray that no matter what happens, they would remain set apart. They would remain in Christ with word, action, and deed. They would always look to you for guidance and wisdom because I know how the world acts and thinks and talks and I don't want to live that way and I don't want my small children to live that way. And that starts with me and I have the opportunity and the privilege and the honor of raising my, my children with Christian morals and values. So if you're not praying with your kids every night, I would encourage you to do so. But when things come our way that we don't like, what do we do? How do we respond? How do we act? What happens when people make you mad? I mean, people make me mad often. And the world says, hey, it's fine, just get even. The world says, that's fine, payback is a you know what, right? 
But vengeance is mine, says the Lord, not yours. So what do we do as we live lives full of disunity, distress, distrust, and disturbing things? What do we do? How do we live lives that are different and holy and set apart? Because we are called to reflect Jesus' love and peace and humility, even when it's hard, even when we feel like we're hard-pressed and our backs are against the wall, but we are not crushed. Even when the world says, hey, however you want to live this way, that's fine. Just do it that way. Well, last week, like I said, we, we read we are to rid ourselves of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Well, Mr. Peter, the wise guy, the sage, the elder, he writes us some more in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 8. This is what he says. He says, finally... He says, all of you, be like-minded. Can you say like-minded? He says, be sympathetic. He says, love one another. Be compassionate and humble. He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. He says, on the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing for whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and they have to do good. They must seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And then he says... Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are what? Blessed. He says, don't fear their threats or be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So Peter's writing and he says, finally, I mean, we've had eight weeks and we're leading up to this point. And he says, finally, it's the pinnacle of the letter. And it, and it still goes on and there's some really good stuff in there. But we, we're finishing it, it up right now. But he says, it's about time. He says, finally, he says, are you listening? Are you paying attention to what I'm about to tell you? Everyone who has been scattered and everyone who is listening to these words right now, what do we do in a world that is backward? How do we live in a world where Jesus is not the priority. He says, be like-minded. The Greek word there is homothron, and it means agreeing, it means together, it means having unity. He's saying have the same mindset. You don't have to agree 100% on everything, because that's probably not possible, but we are to have similar thoughts. And then he says, be sympathetic. Sympathy means you share the experience. You share the experience. If someone is going through something, you don't just say, I'm sorry, I'm praying for you. You share the experience with them. You go through it with them. And then he says, you know what? You have to also love one another. And, you know, there's a lot of words for love in the Greek. This one is phileo, which means brotherly love, right? It's a Christian love. Love your brother. Love your sister in Christ. There's no basis for any Christian living without loving one another. He says, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another. And then he says, be compassionate and be humble. And the word for compassionate here is crazy. You want to know what it means? Literally, it means healthy bowels. (laughs) If you have compassion on someone, it means that it's shaking you to your core. Your inner organs are feeling something. And figuratively speaking, it means moved Deeply, it's the capacity to share the experience, love one another, and be moved to the core. And then he says, there's got to be humility in this. Now, humility is a foreign concept to most 21st century Americans. But it is also a foreign concept to the ancient people, the Greeks and the Romans. I mean, they lived their life based on brute force and strength. And they considered meekness to be a weakness. But Jesus Christ, the chief servant, he models humility time and time again throughout his life. 
And if you've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, the Gospels, the, the books of the Bible that go over Jesus' life, you've probably come across the story where Jesus is hanging on a cross. You familiar with that one? And he's hanging up there. And do you know what I would do if I were Jesus in that moment? I would get even. I, I would rain down a legion of angels. I would remove myself from the cross and zap my enemies with lightning bolts. You know what I do? I would snap my fingers in the Z formation, Z for Zach, and I would turn everyone into dust. <laughs> I would just be like, be gone with all of you. And praise Jesus that I'm not Jesus because we wouldn't be here right now, but... Jesus Christ himself, he's on the cross. He had every right. He had every right to retaliate against those who mocked him, who beat him, who spit on him. In fact, the people around him while he was hanging on the cross, they yelled, save yourself, dude. Hey, pull yourself down from there. If you are the great and almighty God, save yourself. And you know what he does? He just kind of hangs there and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. They don't understand the reality of what's taking place. He didn't seek revenge. He didn't get even. He didn't do what he was entitled to do, what he could have done, probably what he should have done. He extended grace. He was sympathetic. He loved them and he was moved deeply. And that's what we're called to do in a world that seems crazy. That's what we're called to do when our feelings are hurt or we feel like we have been wronged time and time again. How do you respond in those situations? How do you respond when people hurt you? How do you respond when people are lying about you? Stabbing you in the back. Do you find yourself being more merciful or are you a mercenary hired for blood? Are you extending grace or are you finding yourself being resentful in your retaliation? Are you looking for judgmental justice or are you seeking peace and a calm coexistence? How do we as followers of Jesus Christ find unity, be sympathetic, love one another, and show humility and compassion? Peter told us in verses nine through 12, he said, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, Repay evil with blessing because this is, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing for whoever would love life and see good days must, must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil, turn from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. So if you are taking notes, number one, Peter tells us to repay evil with Blessing, repay evil with blessing. And if you remember Peter, he was one of the guys who was with Jesus in the garden, right? And evil and betrayal are walking through the garden with Judas. And they're going to betray Jesus. Do you know what he does? He repays evil with evil. He pulls out a sword and he chops the guy's ear off. Now look at him. Look how far he's come. Look how he's matured in Christ. And he's like, don't repay evil with evil. Repay evil with blessing. You know that thing that I did in the garden? Yeah, big whoops, big mistake. My bad. Don't do that. He says, violence isn't the answer. And Jesus teaches us time and time again. And Peter writes, repay evil with blessing. And we hear that and we're like, what? You want me to do what now? They, they, they've slandered me. They've lied about me. They, they, they've gone to my friends and, and they've spread rumor after rumor. You want me to do what? You just want me to let it happen? You see the knife in my back? You just want me to leave it there? Jesus in Matthew 5, 43 and 44, he says, you've heard it said. He's telling the people around him, you've heard it said the world has told you this. Love your, enemy and, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I, Jesus, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The world says, crush your enemies, but Jesus says, love them. He says, seek peace, pursue peace, and pray for the people who hate you. 
And so what is our response to our enemies? How do we handle tension and conflict? Number two, if you're taking notes, you extend grace rather than revenge. You extend grace rather than revenge. Proverbs 17, 13 says, if you repay good with evil, guess what's never gonna leave your house? Evil will never leave your house. If you repay good with evil, evil will never leave you. And then Peter says, who is going to harm you if you do good? In a world that says tit for tat or blow for blow, Peter says, it can't come to that if you're doing good. Because if you are doing good, how can evil repay evil? There, there's no evil to begin with. But then he says, if you suffer, even for doing what is right, you are blessed. And Jesus in Matthew 5, 10 says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says throughout scripture, hey, you know the people trying to kill your body? Yeah, don't worry about them. It's okay. Jesus, in John, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Paul says, hey, don't worry about anything, but what do you do? Number three, what does Peter teach us? He says, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. To revere Christ as Lord means to hold Jesus in the highest regard. It means show a deep respect and an awe and submission to his authority. It means recognizing Christ's divinity and sovereignty over all aspects of life, honoring him through faith, obedience, and worship. Revering Christ means that we live in a way that reflects his teaching and trusts in his leadership and acknowledges his role as ultimate authority and savior and we do all of those things so that those who speak maliciously against our good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Listen to what Paul writes. He writes something very similar in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse nine. He says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves, never lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position and do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, what are you supposed to do? Live at peace with who? Some people live at peace, peace with just some people, right? Is that what it says? Just the people who agree with me? Just my friends, just my family, just the people who cheer for the cowboys or don't cheer for the cowboys? Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, what are you supposed to do? If your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, what do you do? You give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Peter and, and Paul sound a lot alike in their passages. I think they were, were onto something. In a world full of retaliation, and where payback is normal, God calls us to a higher standard. He says, be set apart, be holy, live different lives. It's a new standard of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And we know this is hard. We know this is challenging or else we wouldn't be talking about it. But it comes from a heart that is fully surrendered to God. It comes from fully knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, where each day you make your relationship with him the priority. You read his word. You, you soak it up. You marinate in it. You pray without ceasing. You pray every single day, all day. Talking, conversing with the creator 
of the universe, praying big prayers, and then you get to pick up your cross, your, your torture device, and you get to follow after God. No matter where he leads, no matter where he calls you, no matter what he says, you want to live holy lives, you want to live lives that are set apart, follow Jesus and he will take you where you need to go. Not where we think we want to go, but where we need to go. And I think there's something powerful about a humble believer living with a deep sense of hope because it stands out in a world filled with fear and arrogance. And then people get to see us living with this peace and hope, especially in hard times, especially in times that don't make any sense in difficult seasons and situations. And then they get to wonder, where does that hope come from? And Peter has an emphasis. He says, when we share our hope, do it with gentleness and respect. Live with the hope and joy that comes from Christ and Christ alone. Let your life be so filled with Jesus that others notice and say, why are you the way that you are? Have you ever said that about someone weird? Usually we say, why are you the way that you are? We have to live life in a way where people are questioning, not because we don't have integrity, because it's so high because we don't talk like the world or act like the world or think like the world or live like the world. And then they say, why are you so different? What makes you tick? What what is wrong with you? And you say, it's because of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then you get to let your light shine in the darkness. And then you get to do it with humility and you don't come across as prideful or pushy because that's what the world says to do. And you just love people through word, action, and deed the way Christ has called us to love each and every person. Now, if you can picture for just a quick second, imagine a lighthouse. Can you picture the lighthouse right now? It's, just, it's a lighthouse. Just imagine a lighthouse, okay? And, and it's kind of storming. Does the lighthouse scream, hey, watch out, there's a storm? No. What does it do? It shines. It just, it just shines. It doesn't, it doesn't scream. It doesn't demand attention. It doesn't say, hey, watch out. It just shines. And, and I think in the shine, I think there might be a whisper that the lighthouse says, and it, it says, here I am, safety is this way. Just, just come over here. You see the light? I'm gonna shine through the darkness. I'm gonna tell you where to go. We don't need to force anything because we have been called to let our light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heavens. And then Peter says, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. You gotta live with the hope that comes from Christ and that comes from fully knowing and understanding him and his sacrifice and what he has done on the cross because if he pulled himself off the cross, we wouldn't be here and salvation would not be possible. God loved us so much, he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on our behalf. And then we get to follow him as Lord and Savior and Shepherd and Leader and King. And we do it with humility and we do it with meekness and the world says that doesn't make any sense. But we do it so they can't question our character or our intentions and we let that speak volumes in a world that says an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. So the next time someone hurts you or slanders you or stabs you in the back or says something cruel or untrue about you, what are you going to do? Peter writes, he says, repay evil with blessing. He says, extend grace rather than revenge. And then he says, put Jesus at the top of the priority list. You revere him. You love him. You are in awe of him and his divinity and his sovereignty and his goodness. And so for some of us right now, we might not have ever made the decision to follow Jesus for the first time. You you might just be living the way that the world has been telling you and teaching you to live for so long. And if that's you, I, I just would ask and pray that think about what that looks like. Think about what the world is asking you to do and calling you to do. And then think about the opposite of that. And, and, and that's what Jesus is wanting not from you, but for you. Jesus wants everything for you. He wants the good things for you. He doesn't want anything from you. 
He wants you to be like him and he wants you to be like Christ and, and to live for him. So if you have never made a decision, you can make that decision today and you can accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and King of your life and you can be baptized in his name. But for others of us, we might have made that decision and we might just need some prayer. We might need someone to talk to. Whatever next step you have in your spiritual journey, there's gonna be some people down here in the front. We would love to talk with you. We would love to pray for you and we would love to baptize you if that is what you need to do. So if you need anything, you can come down to the front, but let's stand.